Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Pasord and I'm a psychiatrist based in London. Today we're talking to Faye, who is a young mum who developed quite serious postnatal depression uh, following the delivery of her first pregnancy. Faye, before you got pregnant and we talk about this delivery that led to the postnatal depression, you had been pregnant before but there was a miscarriage. Tell us a bit about that. Um, well, I was overjoyed to find out I was pregnant and then when I was about six weeks pregnant I started bleeding um, but only a very small amount. Um, I went to an early pregnancy clinic and had an early ultrasound which was inconclusive and um, they couldn't tell really what was going on but thought I had my dates wrong um, and then over the next month I had more bleeding, more scans and um, eventually they diagnosed me with a blighted ovum um, which is where no pregnancy develops inside the omniotic sac. Okay, and then what happened? Um, I was told to go home and, and wait for a miscarriage or I could have a DNC. I felt I would prefer to wait to have the miscarriage. Um, and I also secretly hoped it wouldn't happen. I still was clinging on to the hope that the pregnancy would be okay somehow. Um, and I spent that weekend with my husband trying to take our minds off things and then I, I felt a very bad pain and I ran to the toilet and I miscarried the pregnancy into the toilet. That must have been very distressing. Um, it was incredibly distressing. Um, I, until that moment I still thought I had a chance, I still thought this pregnancy would work um, and it, there was a lot of blood, there was a lot of pain, I was very distressed. My poor husband had never seen me like that before. I'm a very calm, measured person most of the time and I just lost control, I was so upset. He drove me straight to hospital. Um, I lost almost too much blood but um, thankfully I was okay, I was able to come home. How did you feel the medical services dealt with that situation? Um, I can't remember a lot of it to be honest. I remember having to have an internal examination and being incredibly distressed um, and almost having to be sort of held down while they obviously had to check that there was no remainder of the pregnancy but I didn't really understand that at the time and I felt quite violated um, and quite distressed at the whole situation. How did that set you up emotionally as it were for the next pregnancy? Well, in all honesty, it took me at least two months to fully get over what had happened um, to me. But we kept trying for a baby. I, I felt that when I fell pregnant again, it would rectify everything. And when I did, um, I certainly felt triumphant. <laughs> I'd done it, and I had a very strong sense that this pregnancy was fine, um, and this time everything would be okay. And how did the pregnancy pan out up until the delivery? It was absolutely fine. It was a lovely pregnancy. Um, I really, really thoroughly enjoyed it. I loved the whole getting bigger and um, people leaving seats for you on the bus and holding doors open for you and things. I, I absolutely had a fantastic time and I really enjoyed planning for my labour. I had very set ideas about what I wanted my birth to be like. But it's interesting because after people miscarry, they get quite nervous during the next pregnancy. They, they are hypervigilant for any signs of a potential miscarriage, but they didn't happen mm. to you. Well, no, and um, I actually had breakthrough bleeds on the first three months when my, pre my period was due. The first time it happened, I did panic, um, but I was able to have a scan after each bleed, which did put my mind at rest, and then by the time I was 12 weeks, had that 12-week scan, was told everything was okay, and then I really could properly enjoy myself but the first time I bled I was very scared. So what happened in the delivery? Um, I planned a home birth. Um, I was given a long list of midwife numbers to call when I went into labour. Um, so I duly went into labour 10 days late. I called all the numbers and there were no reply <laughs> on any of the numbers. Uh, so I left it a couple of hours, tried again, no reply on any of the numbers. Um, a couple of hours later my waters broke, um, tried the numbers again, I finally got hold of a midwife but she was about 20 miles away and couldn't come um, and that's when it all started to go wrong I think. So what happened next? Um, they sent a trainee midwife round um, and her words on opening the door were I can't help you Faye, I'm not qualified, I'll just sit here um, which wasn't great help. Um, my labour was progressing quite fast by this point. I felt the need to push 
um, I was starting to panic and all my um, hypnobirthing training that I'd been using, it started to come undone. I started to get very frightened and that I needed someone there who knew what they were doing and there was no one there to help me. Um, so I said, all right, I'm going to hospital, which is what I really didn't want. I wanted this home birth. And they sent an ambulance and took me into hospital. And Hannah was born about 20 minutes after I set off, set foot off the stretcher. Wow. And, and, then, and then what happened next? <laughs> um, she was taken away from me straight away um, without any explanation. Um, they told me 20 minutes before she arrived that they'd lost her heartbeat. Um, what really happened was because I was so... Um, calm with the hypnobirthing and my body was working so well on its own. She was actually being delivered um, but they were looking for her in my womb and she wasn't there. Um, so I was quite frightened and panicked by that as you can imagine. So I was relieved that she was arri had arrived but then they suddenly whisked her out and I was worried that she'd died. Okay and, and when did you next see her? Um, they brought her back about 10 minutes later. Again no explanation as to where she'd gone. Um, and she was all swaddled and I'd asked for her to be brought back um, naked so I could cuddle her, kangaroo cuddle, so that's what they call it, and, um, and I just felt this is all wrong, everything's gone wrong, and although she was healthy and she was fine, I just, that's when it started to feel like everything had gone wrong. Um, so was that very upsetting? It was more confusing. I was numb and I remember my mum and dad arrived to see me and my mum said later that she just looked at me and there was almost like nothing in my eyes at all. I just felt blank. I, I was holding this baby and I was looking at her and I didn't feel anything but just numbness and confusion and that I'd failed. That was my overriding fear. I failed to do what I wanted to do. Do you think the postnatal depression was beginning around that time then? Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, if someone had just put their arms around my shoulders then and said, look, this is absolutely fine, it's normal, maybe. Um, unfortunately, because Hannah was born on the evening of a bank holiday, my family were shown the door about 20 minutes after she was born and I found myself alone on a ward. There were no other mums on the ward with this new baby feeling shocked and confused and all those horrible feelings and no one to talk to. So what happened next? Um, I spent the night with Han um, up in the ward. I couldn't sleep. I kept trying to feed her. Um, she couldn't feed. Um, I asked for help a couple of times. Um, they tried a couple of times quite nicely. And then after about the fourth or fifth time when I couldn't get her to latch on, they were getting quite impatient with me. Uh, so I stopped asking and I just spent most of the night crying. I felt like the worst mother in the universe. It sounds as though one of the things that went wrong here was that you felt under enormous pressure to breastfeed when it wasn't working out and you weren't given an alternative plan. Definitely. I mean, no one said um, throughout that night, and Hannah basically just screamed for food for 12 hours. No one said, look, should we just get some SMA or, and, you know, try again in the morning? It was like, you know, you have to do this. Come on, you can do it. Other mums do it. You need to do it. Um, and I, I just couldn't. And I've since been told that the way that my nipples are shaped she wouldn't have ever been able to breastfeed anyway. Um, so, you know, if I felt, like, say, the pressure, I must be able to do it. There's something wrong with me because I can't. What happened the next day? Um, my husband came in to see me. I tried to hide how I was feeling from him. Um, and by the, they told me that I wasn't going to go home until I breastfed her. So I tried all day to breastfeed feed her. And by now I'd been awake for just over 24 hours trying to breastfeed my baby and and I knew inside that things you know things weren't feeling good but I desperately wanted to go home I thought if I go home I'll be okay did you manage to get home in the end I did yeah they said that I could go um, only because I asked for a bottle of milk I said well if I'm if I can't breastfeed her <coughs> excuse me um, give me some milk I fed her with that and then they sent us home but you had to take the initiative to solve the problem. I did, yes, and I had to beg for that. I had to ask more than once, and my husband had to ask, and my parents had to ask as well. And um, just seeing her latch onto that bottle and actually having some food made me feel temporarily quite good. And knowing then, right, we can go home. I'm sure I'll sort this breastfeeding thing out as soon as we get home. That was my plan. But it was only temporary, that, that, that feeling of relief. It was, yes, because when I got home I tried to breastfeed her again, I couldn't breastfeed her, um, 
so we, we gave up. We went and bought bottles and we bought formula milk and she fed. But every now and again I'd try and breastfeed her and I, I really felt like I'd let her down because I couldn't do it. And how long did this go on for? Uh, the first week, I think, um, the midwives who came to see me, some of them were very encouraging and said, you know, you can keep trying. I tried expressing, I bought a breast pump and at least I thought, well, she'd be getting a bit of breast milk that way. Um, but I found that I was staying up most nights trying to feed her and I almost went five days without any sleep whatsoever. And by the end of that, I was a complete nervous wreck and I started to lose all sense of reality. In what way did you lose all sense of reality? I didn't want Hannah. I wanted someone to take her um, and look after her because I clearly was inadequate as a mother. Um, I wanted to do things like run out into the road in front of a truck. I didn't want to kill myself, but I wanted to be in hospital with someone else to look after me um, because I, I, couldn't, I couldn't cope. Um, I was trying to hide it. I was still hiding it from my family at this point. But inside, I just felt like everything was crumbling. Did you have um, any other strange or unusual experiences during this time? Um, I do remember going to see my doctor, and he told me something about cavemen looking after their babies, and I remember feeling really quite confused about that. Um, I had very vivid dreams and hallucinations because I was so tired. Um, I felt that every time that Hannah fell asleep, she wouldn't wake up, that she would die, and it would be my fault. Um, I had all these things going on in my head. Um, I just felt completely alone, like no one could help me. What was your lowest point? Um, my lowest point was when Hannah was about two weeks old. We'd moved in with my mum and dad because my husband um, didn't know what was going on and couldn't cope and I had to be physically restrained from walking into the road and throwing myself under a car. And what happened at your mum and dad's? Um, they managed to get in touch with um, the community mental health service and they got involved at about two weeks um, and then I was assessed by a psychiatrist and it, it started to get better from there but only very slowly and intermittently sometimes I'd feel a bit better sometimes I wouldn't now, although I'm a psychiatrist, please feel free to be brutal about your okay. experience of seeing the psychiatrist. What was that like? Um, initially, I thought she was really good. She just sat down and let me talk, and that was the one thing I hadn't done. I hadn't just spilled all this awful stuff that was going out in my head. I was too scared to say, someone else have Hannah, let's have her adopted, because I thought someone might take me seriously, you know, and social services might come and take my baby, and I, you know, I just was able to tell her everything. She told me to write down how I felt, and then she'd come back and see me in a week. And when she come back, came back, I told her everything I'd done, and she was quite dismissive, and she left within about 10 minutes. And then I went all the way downhill again, um, which was a shame, because initially I thought she was really good. Why was she dismissive? What was she dismissive of? Um, I tried to show her what she'd written. She said she didn't have time to look at it, um, that I just needed to keep taking the medication, and she'd come back in a couple of weeks and see how I was doing. And I felt you know, that I'd sort of wasted her time almost, or that I wasn't particularly important, and because um, I I'd, I'd trusted her quite quickly and I felt quite betrayed that she wasn't there to help me. What was this medication that you were taking? Had she prescribed it? Yeah, she prescribed me, oh goodness, what it was called. It was, one of them was sertraline, mm -hmm. and the other one um, began with a Q. Oh, God, what's it called? I later found out they give it to schizophrenics. Was it quetiapine? Uh, yes, it was. Okay, do you know what dose it was? Um, was it no. 25 milligrams? Something it like was that? a low dose. I'm pretty okay. sure it was. couldn't have been more than 50. Okay. Um, well, what about the sertraline? What dose were you taking of that? That was quite high. Was, would 100 be too yes. high? No, no. 100 <laughs> might be right. So but sertraline I'm... is an antidepressant, and yeah. quetiapine is a medication that can be described as antipsychotic. So you got both at the same time? Yes. Oh, it sounds like there's a bit of noise there. In the back. Sorry, that's my um, that's my toddler <laughs> trying to get in. He's gone now. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so, um, what did you think about taking medication? And were you slightly surprised to be offered it? Um, I understood that I might be given antidepressants. Um, I had suffered with depression um earlier years earlier, and I had been given antidepressants for it. So I expected that I would be given those. Uh, the quetiapine gave me some very, very funny symptoms. I didn't take that 
um, further than one dose. Um, but the search for you and I sort of understood as a necessary evil to make me better. Did that interfere with the breastfeeding? I'd given up by then completely, um, so they said it was safe to prescribe it to me. So what about expressing though and, and feeding that way? That wasn't I, working. Um, I tried, I, I wasn't really producing enough um, and as the second week um, since Hannah was born approached and I was, I was really going very downhill, I didn't want to do anything for her at all. Um, so my husband was bottle feeding her, I'd given up. So it sounds as though the psychiatrist initially was helpful but not so helpful later on. So what was helpful in the end? In the end, I took the antidepressants, um, but I had in the back of my mind that I would beat this eventually, that I was strong enough somehow to beat this, and I kept reminding myself of it. I made myself go out every day with Hannah. We went for a walk for about two hours. I just, I just forced myself into doing the stuff I didn't want to do, um, and then I remember she actually brought me out of it. At six weeks, we were still at mum and dad's. I still wasn't making much progress. I was getting slightly better, but, you know, not amazingly better. I came downstairs, and my mum was um, winding her, and she just did a big burp, and she looked up at me, and she smiled for the first time at me, and my heart just melted. <laughs> and all those feelings that I hadn't had up until that point suddenly came rushing in. So in a sense, the, the therapy or that you got on the health service was not really helpful. Not really, no. And I felt if someone had said, look, you can meet someone once a week and just talk to them, I felt that would have been more helpful. I just needed someone to talk to who knew what they were talking about. You can talk to your family and they'll say, yes, that's terrible, or, you know, it'll pass, you'll get better. But I just wanted to talk to someone with a qualification <laughs> um, to help me understand why I was feeling these things. And that never happened? No, it never happened. But after the psychiatrist came, you, he, they didn't come back? She came back briefly for that 10 minutes um, second appointment and that was it. And you didn't have any other input from, from mental health services at all? Um, no, apart from one time when my husband called the crisis line because I'd gone very bad and that was pretty much it. It was left in the care of the midwives and the health visitors. But who was supervising the medication because someone should have been supervising that? Um, I don't think anyone was. When I ran out of what I was taking, I just stopped. Um, there was no follow-up. I just stopped taking it. Oh, dear. Um, no, <laughs> not great. So, so um, okay, so you kind of got better by yourself, uh, although yeah. the antidepressant might have helped. I think it definitely helped. Uh, it definitely... Uh, I felt that I couldn't think straight on antidepressants, but then a lot of the things in my head were things I didn't want to think about. It masked those bad thoughts. It also stopped me having good thoughts, um, but then when I started bonding with Hannah, I had those good thoughts, and it eventually turned things around. And what's happened since? Um, I vowed I would never have another child, <laughs> um, which obviously didn't quite happen. Um, I, I started bonding with Hannah. Um, we're very, very close now. Um, and it was almost after a while like the postnatal depression hadn't happened. I still had bad days. I found that by talking to a lot of my friends um, with children the same age that we'd all had it to some extent. It was a lot more common than I thought and I stopped feeling ashamed of it. I did feel very ashamed. I stopped feeling that. I tell people now. If they ask, I tell them. Um, when I was pregnant with Dan, um, the service I got was actually amazing. Um, I was in constant contact with the mental health team. They were worried that I might have post depression again. They told me then that they'd nearly hospitalised me. And I think looking back, you don't realise how serious it was until someone says that to you. So how come the service was so much better the second time round? I'm not sure. Um, all I know is that as soon as I fell pregnant with Dan and had my first midwife appointment, I was then um, seen by another psychologist, a psychiatrist, sorry, and I had a weekly meeting with the community mental health nurse um, to make sure that I was okay. Uh, it was a completely different experience the second time around. I felt very looked after, and I think um, it probably helped. I was obviously very worried I was going to have post depression again, and I think it helped me feel better. Maybe I wouldn't this time. And if I did, I had a safety net. 
but you didn't get postnatal depression the second time around. I didn't, no. Um, I went on a mission to not get postnatal depression. <laughs> I had an independent midwife um, and I had a home birth in a birthing pool. I had placenta encapsulation. Um, I, I just did everything I thought would help me and I think it did. When you say independent midwife, do you mean someone um, that you saw privately then? That's right, yeah. Um, it was the wife of one of my friends. I didn't realise she was an independent midwife. She took on my care from about 20 weeks. Um, she was a great support to me. And um, we basically worked out a plan of action. You know, the things that triggered my postnatal depression, how to avoid those triggers. Um, so I felt that we were well prepared for whatever was going to happen. By the end of the pregnancy, I was quite open-minded. I thought, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But if I do, I know that I've got help this time, that people are going to help me. But it's interesting um, that if, if this was someone you were seeing privately, I mean, there, there, there's an affordability issue. It's lucky that you were able to afford it. Some other people would not have been able to afford it. And they may have had another negative experience like you had. Absolutely, time. absolutely. And in all honesty, we can't afford it. We're still paying it back now. We used up all our savings and we pay monthly when we can. Um, thankfully we had a very understanding independent midwife, but it was worth every single penny. So looking back on your experiences, what would your advice be to mums in a similar situation? I think when you write your birthing plan, not to take it as bread, that might not necessarily happen. Be as open-minded as you can possibly be to the outcomes. And if things don't work out how you planned, don't blame yourself because it really isn't your fault. And if you can't breastfeed, that isn't your fault either. Um, also, to be prepared for your baby to just turn your life upside down and just go with it. And don't worry about washing your, you know, cleaning your house and washing the clothes. Just enjoy it and don't worry. Um, I spent a lot of time worrying, a lot of time being anxious, and I wish I just enjoyed it a bit more. Do you feel there's too much pressure on mums to breastfeed? I think sometimes there is, yes. Um, I think everyone has a different experience. I felt quite pressurised to breastfeed, but then some of my friends were not so. There, I think maybe there could be more of a standard across the board. Sorry, that's my eldest daughter coming home and she's quite loud. I'll take her away in a second. Okay. Um, yeah, I think more uniformity across the board might be good if everyone, I don't know if everyone's trained in the same way even. Um, I certainly felt a lot of pressure, but with Dan, with my second child, um, I had no pressure at all to breastfeed him. I tried, and I couldn't, and I let it go. But it sounds like the breastfeeding pressure you came under at a very early stage might have been unhelpful. I think so, yes, because... In all the pregnancy books, it says about breast being best, and you think, yes, I, you have this lovely image of feeding your baby and it being very natural, um, and sometimes it just can't happen for people, um, and I think there needs to be more understanding of that. Uh, you know, and I remember talking to some mums about breastfeeding and saying that I couldn't do it, and getting some sort of funny looks like, oh, well, why couldn't you? And uh, whereas other people were like, yeah, good for you. If you can't do it, you can't do it. It doesn't have to be the pressured situation that it, it can be for some months. At the risk of being slightly brutal, it sounds as though at some basically important stages there was a fair amount of incompetence. Like that midwife that turned up and said she was a trainee midwife. Yes. And also the breastfeeding advice sounded like it wasn't very good. No, I agree. I, I definitely agree with that, that um, it could have been a lot better. Um, I, I think they took it for granted that I knew what I was doing almost and I really had no idea. I needed to be shown it as though I'd never done it before, which I hadn't. And it was more sort of, you know, they, at one point they were opening my dressing gown and sort of pushing my nipples into Hannah's mouth and it, it just didn't feel like a good experience at all. I, I didn't think it had to be like that. And uh, Faye, your, your second pregnancy went un uneventfully in terms of mental health. Yes, um, and I was going through quite a stressful time at that time. Um, I was self-employed uh, after I had Hannah. I had to sell my business because um, my pregnancy with Dan was a big surprise. I had So I had to contend with selling your business, um, which was probably the most stressful thing I've ever done, um, and try and maintain an even keel being pregnant with Dan, but I managed it. And what are your feelings about the future now? I feel fine. I mean, uh, some days 
you do feel a little low for whatever reason, but I always fall back on my um, my ways of solving it with Hannah. If I feel a bit low, I get out, I go and do some walking. Sorry. Um, I, I go out with the children, I get some fresh air, I do some exercise, I make sure I look after myself and if I am feeling bad then I don't beat myself up about it and I will talk to somebody. My husband now knows exactly when I'm feeling bad, when I need to talk to him and he knows exactly what to say. He doesn't just placate me, he listens, he gets me to talk about what I'm feeling and we try and work out a solution. What about the Association for Postnatal Illness, the charity that specialises in this area? What about your contact with them? Tell us a bit about that. Um, I decided to um, to volunteer uh, to help other mums. Um, I was looking um, specifically to volunteer for a charity for postnatal depression and I found the APNI. Um, so I volunteered. I've had a couple of mums that um, I've supported and if there's any good thing to come out of postnatal depression I think it's helping other people and being able to say to other mums look I've been through this I know how you're feeling and you will get better that's the one thing I can promise you you will feel better you won't feel like this forever did it surprise you how common this is definitely it definitely did and um, what I actually did when um, I was running my own business was um, classes for mums and babies <laughs> Um, and a lot of it was focused on how to stimulate oxytocin release to um, to help bond with your baby. So I tell my mums, I'd, classes of 20, I tell them I had postnatal depression so bad I was almost hospitalised. I wish I'd had something like this to make me understand it. I'd just be honest with them and a lot of them would be nodding and saying, yep, yeah, we've been through exactly the same thing. Over half a class of 20 mums. Faye, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.